speech. Um, welcome to the internet assholes rather than assholes because I can't do American. But uh, anyway, Jared, welcome. So I promised someone that I wouldn't make it too interactive, but it is three o'clock, so if I could ask everyone to stand up just for a second, <laughs> just, just one second. So all, all I need you to do is, here, I'll put this down so I can demonstrate. Just shake your arms. This is good, it gets the, the limbic system going, it's the blood flowing, and that's it. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I've talked to some of you about uh, talking to computers, because that's, that's what me and my team do at Google now. Um, but I want to kind of rewind a little bit and, um, and kind of talk about uh, what I was doing for the last two years. I was the design lead at Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit that runs Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a really interesting challenge when it comes to um, communities, communities that build massive projects like Wikipedia and all the other sister projects to Wikipedia. Um, it's kind of a, a living lab for something that doesn't work in theory but works in practice. <laughs> So um, the talk I want to talk to you today about is really more about communities and has very little to do with Google. So um, if you actually didn't read the synopsis, what I'm going to talk about is building healthy online communities. And there's something that's, we can kind of rewind kind of back to the beginning of human history. Uh, communities, we, we talk to each other um, around campfires. We talk to each other um, about our day, about our goals. And, and there's something different about this type of conversation and an online conversation. And the biggest thing is, it's not real time. You don't see people's faces. When you offend someone, you don't know immediately. Maybe you don't know ever. And so when we think about how to translate the experience of a conversation, a real conversation, into an online space, what are some of the things we have to think about? So um, there's a lot of people in the world. And I think my numbers are slightly different than the Cisco people, but about 3 billion of them are online. Um, so I'll just, I'll just ask, in this audience, <laughs> raise your hand if you've ever cut someone off in traffic. Just keep your hands up. Raise your hand if you've ever lied. No, keep your hands up if you've, if you've cut us off. Um, raise your hand if you've ever lied about being busy to not go out with someone some night. OK. <laughs> raise your hand if you've ever told your boss you were doing something and you weren't doing it yet because you were going to do it tomorrow. OK, that's about 91% of people. So yeah. So that's a lot of people online that are just total jerks. And uh, you know, we, can, we can scale that you know, however we want. Like Maybe it's a little white lie. Maybe you're actually harassing someone. But that's a lot of people. It's a, lot, it's a problem. Um, and so how do, you, how do you deal with a scenario where you have so many bad actors? Are these people assholes? Maybe, maybe not. What about these people? No, probably not. So the thing is, you, communities will naturally form around anything. Like, I, I've talked to a few people, um, you know, do you have a community for your product? Some of you said no, and then I talked to you a little bit more, and you're like, oh, actually we do. I think the only two folks from uh, the, uh, the French steel manufacturer might be the only people in, the in, the, in this room that don't have a community of some sort. Um, and so you can think about communities in a lot of different ways. You can think of products that are communities, like Facebook and Twitter. You can think about communities around support. Um, communities around people um, having kind of a, a love or a joy around using a product. Those are all communities. And even if you don't think of yourself as a, as a company with a community, you probably still have one. Whether you choose to interact with that community, whether you choose to kind of be part of it, that's up to you. But you still have it. So the customer experience is, is kind of the end-to-end -end thing. So a lot of times you'll say, oh, you know, we've, we've optimized the, the purchase flow or we've optimized the sign-up flow. But what happens when there's a problem? What happens when something breaks? The support flow, everything about any touch point that your customer has with your company is part of their customer experience of your product. So my flight here to London was delayed by three hours. 
and that sucked. And then I get to the airport, and I have uh, something that's called pre-check, which allows me to kind of get through security faster. British Airways doesn't participate in that. So I, uh, I tweeted to British Airways, and uh, they responded within 10 minutes. I was like, wow. And uh, it was signed with someone's name. And then they went and looked back at another tweet that I hadn't really directed at British Airways and commented on that. And I was like, wow, it's a really great experience. And, and maybe I didn't go to their website, go to their forums, and talk directly to them, but they owned the method of communication that I chose to use to talk to with them. And that's something that really says, like, they own that community. So uh, when we think about, you know, kind of our social responsibility, um, kind of breaking it down into three things. Having communities that reflect kind of the, the breadth of, of everyone who wants to participate, everyone in the world, why that's valuable. Um, and then, you know, I think some people probably care about costs, so I threw in a slide about that too. <laughs> um, the idea is that when you have inclusive communities, you have lots of different viewpoints. And lots of different viewpoints, as lots of the speakers have said thus far, really is going to improve the kind of, kind of final output. Whether that's your product or just the quality of your community, that, uh, that kind of inclusion, that ability to have lots of different viewpoints is really important. So there's a company in the United States called OkCupid. It's a dating website. Um, but one thing that set them apart from other sites is how much they relied on, on data. Um, I don't remember if the founders were from MIT or Stanford. Uh, it might have been an East Coast school. But what they highlighted is that no matter how kind of forward thinking, no matter how open-minded people are, the data shows that everyone is, is kind of deeply tribal, deeply racist. And, and this is something we, we kind of have to, we have to embrace. And it's something at Google that we, we acknowledge and we, we try to, to take action to go beyond that. And it, it's human nature. Um, and it's, a, it's a kind of an ugly part of human nature that we don't like to think about. But in the end, what it means is that we, we gravitate to people that are like ourselves. And so I leave it up to all of you to say, is it important that I make a community, that I make a conscious effort to be inclusive with the communities that I build? I can't make that decision for you, um, but you have to kind of evaluate whether that's something that's important to you. The last part is that when you think about the, the kind of acquiring new users, it's expensive, and it's getting more and more expensive. This is from a company that really, they only kind of limit their scope to, to apps and casual games. And over the last you know, year and a half, it's, it's gone up to like $4 per new user acquisition. I'm sure this varies a lot by industry. The general trend, yeah, exactly. The general trend is that it's increasing. And I think that's, that's the kind of important part, um, whether your price point is a dollar or you know, a BMW. So um, I, there's a lot of problems. And so I want to give a few solutions. Um, and I think it's interesting because it doesn't always rely on, on money or special technology. Um, it relies more on kind of social hacking. So the first part, uh, self-policing. So uh, if you're familiar with, uh, I guess six months, a year ago, Gamergate was a huge thing on Twitter. Um, I'm not going to talk about Gamergate. <laughs> what I am going to talk about is the fact that, that Twitter allowed a very subtle tweak to their interface to allow what they called social block lists. Social block lists allow an individual to block other Twitter users and then export their block list in a file format that another user could import that block list. And it was almost like open sourcing a block list. People could go and post these and say, these are people that are not having a healthy conversation and so we can basically just mute them. As a group, we can mute them. So this was something that the, the tech investment from Twitter was very low. It was just a subtle modification of a feature they already had. But it allowed individuals to kind of take into their own hands what it meant to kind of engineer their social landscape. Uh, Google used to have a similar project where you could kind of say this result is, is spammy, it's not relevant, and actually just block it from your own results in the future. So it also kind of put in individual users' hands the ability to kind of manicure and landscape you know, what their perception of, of the world was. 
A really interesting example also from Facebook, and, and there's been some podcasts and news articles about this, is when you report something on Facebook as, as inappropriate, um, one of the things that they do is instead of just saying, like sending it off into the ether and saying, you know, this is a problem, someone should do something about it, they actually push the user to message the user that was a problem. It's Facebook. They're probably your friend. You probably know them. And so what happens when you press that button, it actually pre-populates a message that says, hey, Sarah, I saw you posted this thing, and it links to the thing, and says, this offends me, this bothers me. Whatever you clicked on the previous step, could you please take it down? And what they found was that that social engineering, that that moving that message and the onus of sending that message to the user was extremely effective. So. We can kind of move, and I'll show you a slide in a second that kind of shows how this, this workflow works, but all those self-policing things work really well when the issue isn't super serious. So this is actually Facebook's workflow guide, and I'll zoom in there, um, for what happens when you report an issue. So it's really complicated, and, uh, and there's lots of different levels of severity. I, don't, I think this is a laser. Maybe it's not. We'll just, oh, there we go. So there's some really serious ones. Like if someone says something that's like a suicidal thought, for instance, that immediately gets funneled into a suicide prevention hotline. And they're actually pretty technical savvy. They'll actually can message people, send them text, not just an actual phone number. But a lot of these kind of filter back and send messages to other people in your network rather than sending messages to Facebook's hired guns. Um, Facebook, Twitter, all these companies have, have hundreds, thousands of people that are solely devoted to, to looking at the content that gets posted on the site and deciding whether it's up to their community standards. This could be things like, can I have a picture of a nursing mother? Can I have male nipples? Can I have female nipples? Um, you know, can we have a beheading on our site? And so the fact that they've clearly stipulated what is part of their community and they've made those, those, kind of, those goals and those aspirations very clear means that when they enforce their rules, no one has any questions about it. Or if they do, there can be a healthy discussion. So the last part is, is intrinsic rewards. And I think for, for Wikipedia especially, this was, this was really beneficial. Um, the reason that Wikipedia does not pay its contributors, its editors, um, is because, A, that would just be untenable, but also because the foundation has no um, editorial oversight on the content. When you start paying people for content, you kind of get into a really weird gray area. So when we look at a site like Quora, for instance, um, I don't know if people use that here, but it's very popular in Silicon Valley, uh, question and answer site. The way that, that people kind of show their expertise in a subject matter um, is, is kind of bubbled up to the surface here on the right-hand side of the site. People get um, these kind of awards. They get, they get recognized as subject matter experts in certain areas. Um, and this, by itself, is kind of enough to keep things sticky. People come back to the site because they get recognized for that. Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, very popular amongst the engineering um, and kind of computer science. They also have a whole kind of lifestyle brand now. Their whole idea of a profile is all about engineering that this person is a subject matter expert, that they're active in this community, and that it's, it's kind of a badge of honor. People can point to this and say, I, I know a lot about C++. I know a lot about, you know, cooking chicken. You know, whatever community you belong to within Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, you can kind of point to this and say, I, I am an expert in this. People look to me, they say that I am I'm good at this thing. So building communities around intrinsic rewards is a way that you can really scale those um, without worrying about you know, paying people or, or kind of going out of your way to, to reward them and say, like, oh, you, you belong here. So those are all the kind of positive things. <laughs> so the, the kind of ways that you can actually design for a good, um, a good community, one of the tools um, that was actually kind of put forward by uh, a designer that used to work with me is what he called troll personas. So people will misuse your products, and they'll misuse your community. Um, and sometimes that's out of kind of necessity. Um, I don't know if any LEGO people are here, but uh, I do wonder what those unexpected ways to use LEGOs are. I don't <laughs> want to know the unexpected uses of ground beef, though. Um, and sometimes they'll misuse your products out of, let's say, confusion. Um, Sometimes they'll misuse your products, though, with actual ill will and malice. 
they'll try to, to weaponize your products. They'll try to use your products in a way to, to forward their own goals that are not in line with your goals of your community. Um, there's plenty of, of stories you see written on like medium posts about you know what was supposed to be there was a great one about like a, a fashion sharing app for teens and and the guy it was just one guy startup and he had to kill it because suddenly it was just filled with kind of totally off topic really inappropriate imagery and and he was like you know i didn't i didn't design for people misusing it I only assumed they'd use it as I designed it. And, and you can't go into pretty much anything assuming that your kind of ideal flow is going to be the way that people use it. So the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is real name policies. And this, a lot of companies have gotten under uh, you know, a lot of bad publicity around enforcing real name policies. And, and I kind of changed it a little bit to say true name policies. If you think about these four sites, which to some degree have, have a real name policy in place, what, what this does is it does create a lot of user trust. Um, you know, when we are around that campfire having a conversation with each other, you know, you see the person's face, you know who they are to some degree. Um, the idea of, of permanence of your name, permanence of your identity going from place to place is something we expect in the real world, but something we don't necessarily expect in the digital world. So does anyone recognize any of those people? No? Does anyone recognize any of these people? Okay. So these are people, they're famous people, that don't use their real names. And, and they have a business reason for not doing that. They have an identity that they've built up. So let's, let's take it out of the realm of like famous people. So if these four people submitted their, their CVs to a company, and all four CVs were exactly the same, not similar, but exactly the same, raise your hand if A is going to get a call back. Raise your hand if B is going to get a call back. Right, B doesn't get a call back. So Stanford and MIT have both done many, many studies that show that names that we perceive as being ethnic or different than ourselves, we perceive their accomplishments and anything that they've done is lower, is less. Let's try it again. Yes? Jared, just to that point, maybe. But when they did it with basketball, <laughs> it flipped. Interesting. Well. Let's talk about for black tech, Africa, tech jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so what about this one? Does Emily get a call back or does Brandon get a call back? Brandon, Brandon gets a call back. So the, the reason that I say this and the reason that I think that, that real name is, is something that's interesting is people have a lot of reasons to not use their legal name on the internet. Whether it comes down to people wanting their opinions and their views to be equally appreciated whether there's a safety concern, whether these people may be, um, you know, from a, a sexuality standpoint, they may be out online and not in the, the real world. There's so many reasons why someone might have built a persona online that is real to them, but not real in a legal sense. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're building your online communities. What does it mean to enforce a names policy? And is it more about consistency or is it more about legality? So the next part is action waiting. And so this is something that you think a lot about when, when you're kind of dealing with, with kind of punishing the bad and rewarding the good. What's worse? When you think about like, if we can say like you have a friend and let's say they burned your house down and then they were in France and they send you a postcard. Are those kind of the same? They seem about the same, right? So when we think about online communities, when someone does something bad, we give them like a minus one. When they do something good, we give them a plus one. And we think we kind of treat all actions as, as equal in our eyes. But in reality, in the real world, we don't do that. Bad things always are worse than good things. Even kind of a slightly bad thing still in our mind will stick. It'll be much worse than a slightly good thing. So um, the last aspect is, is what uh, a lot of people call shadow reputation. There's a lot of different terms for this online. Uh, one of the most interesting ways, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the movie THX 1138, um, 
But it, this happens a lot in online games, um, and they actually call it hell banning, I think. The idea is that someone participates in a community, but because of their kind of shadow reputation that you generate on the back end, they can't actually interact with other users. They can post a comment, they can reply to a comment. None of their actions are visible to other users in the system. And, and what does that do? It, it lets that user think that people don't care about them. It lets that user think that people aren't interested. They are actually rating you lower and lower and lower. And what Uber does is it just gently increases your wait time over and over and over. <laughs> Eventually, every time you call for a cab, it takes 15 minutes, it takes 30 minutes, it takes 60 minutes. You stop using the service. And that's what they want. They don't want you to use the service. You're not part of the community that they want to build. So the last two parts, um, like I said, you don't need special technology. You don't need a lot of money. You don't even necessarily need a lot of people. But what you need to watch out for, um, one thing is called filter bubbles. And this is, like I said earlier, you know, people want to gravitate to people like them, people who think like them. If you give people enough ways to interact with the system to control their view of reality within that system, they will. And what that means is they'll slowly, slowly, slowly get it down to a system where they're only exposed to people who think, look, and act like them. And maybe that's what you want. Hopefully it's not. The last part is scalability. If you rely, like Twitter and Facebook do, on an army of people to start policing posts, it doesn't work. You have to use something that, that kind of marries people and technology. Um, you can't really scale people in that way unless you want to just keep hiring and hiring and hiring until half your company is community monitors. So. <laughs> cool. So, straight away, gentlemen down here, have we got our, here we go. <laughs> don't, don't both throw it at once. Um, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah. With the onset of virtual reality in the next four or five years, do yeah. you think online communities will actually just go back to being normal communities? <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think that, um, you know, we, we, kind of, we kind of laugh at, at Google. There's, there's so much made about the idea that you can run into someone in the hall. And, and there's actually um, space planning uh, kind of ideals around how dense someone should be in an office space to, to kind of make sure that you have these serendipity things. Um, I don't think that, that that's a way that people want to work. Um, I think that's, I still think that VR is going to be kind of more task based. Um, I really, really hope that VR is something that we kind of perpetually are in. Um, but I don't know. Down here. Thank you. Uh, Knowledge management in, in, within uh, organizations uh, is, uh, is, a, is a difficult business. Mm -hmm. And one would have thought that Google would have changed this enormously. And it has changed it to a degree. Have you done any research into actual changes in knowledge management within organizations? And mm -hmm. what are your comments on that? Yeah, so I, can, I, I can't really speak to it from Google's perspective, but I will on, on Wikimedia's side. Um, so one of the, the aspects of, of Wikimedia that uh, we, kind of, we dog fooded everything. So our design docs, our process docs, everything was on Wiki. Um, and we used a site called uh, MediaWiki.org to document all this. Um, every time you made a change, every time you interacted with users, every time a decision was made, um, that was posted in kind of a very structured way. Um, and because anyone could edit it, the, the, kind of the, the, the pressure was on the last person who made a change to be the person who could edit it. And, and we did kind of, uh, our, our motto, and I put it up there, was kind of assume good faith. Um, anyone should be the one that owns that. And I think kind of trying to move away from there being like a group that's responsible for you know, knowledge dissemination, you know, knowing processes, and having that be on, on every individual, it, it's much more scalable. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, thank you. So even if you're not using MediaWiki, wikis are pretty good for that process. <laughs> Any more questions? Stefan. 
Well, one of the big changes with communities is that people reinforce each other's opinions. So mm -hmm. what in the past, when people just couldn't talk on the same scale with each other, it would be a fringe notion that maybe drowned out in the mainstream. Now mm -hmm. you could actually get one person just getting a whole community going and then and starting a movement. Now sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes that can be quite damaging. <laughs> Where do we see all this going? Do you see some names of software filters getting in there? Do you see people's behavior evolving so that they realize just how dangerous or impactful they can be? Yeah, so uh, I talked to a friend who's a project manager at Quora, and, and one of the things that they're doing that's very interesting around that is they are segmenting uh, at a very fine grain level based on geography. So they found that people from India used Quora very differently than people from the United States. And what they decided to do was instead of kind of branching the site, um, they, had a, they had an English only policy, is that they would, based on geography, segment who saw what content. Mm. So uh, someone from India, accessing from India, could go and they would see the same question perhaps that someone from the US had asked, but the answers that they saw would only be from other people who answered from India. And so it kind of limited the damages um, by, by making sure that kind of like-minded people would be exposed to that same content. Um, and there was, I think there's some gray area. Like if something got upvoted beyond a certain extent, maybe it would be surfaced to different geos. Um, but you have to think about kind of how can you make something that's not just totally segmented out um, while still allowing for a little bit of that serendipity for people to kind of be exposed to, to views that aren't quite the same as their own. Great. Jared, thank you so much. That's Thanks. been great. Thank you.